She works at the aerospace department as an associate professor, and they're working on understanding how concrete is going to cure in microgravity. So as you can tell, this episode is probably going to be space related. And, yeah. uh, you know, the, there's a there's been a big like movement in terms of what we need in space. First, for a while, it was all about like the best rockets. How do we get to space? But now you've seen like people talking about setting up a Mars colony or building infrastructure on the moon. Yeah, well, we've started to solve the problems about how do we get to space mm-hmm. efficiently. You know, companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin, Rocket Lab, there's like the whole United Launch Alliance. There's a lot of people that can help send you or send stuff into space. So now we're like, now that we've solved this, you know, fundamental problem, what can we do with these capabilities we have now? And we're talking about colonization, building things. I'm excited about it, but I imagine if you want to build anything with concrete, it's uh, important to determine how well it, uh, how effective it is and how well it sets in space. Does it, do they expect that it will do differently in, in, in zero gravity versus in gravity? Short answer is yes. So, okay. Professor Yamamoto is basing her research off of a previous research that was also done by faculty at Penn State. What they did was take a small amount of concrete, put it on the ISS. It was part of one of the ISS experiments from a couple years ago, and they let it cure. When they brought it back, they did analysis of the microstructure to understand, like, how is it different than concrete that just cured, you know, on planet Earth. But they realized that it, okay. was, that it, was, it was more porous, that was more uh, air trapped in there, which, you know, is going to have complications when it comes to performance and, you know, compressive and tensile strength. So that's what Professor Yamamoto is focusing on. She's got this. Okay. That makes sense. Like the, the concrete isn't uh, settling mm-hmm. and the air is rising to the top because there's no gravity pulling it in one way or another. So the air bubbles probably just get stuck in there. Exactly. So now Professor Yamamoto, she's got this grant from NASA. Um, she needs to model how, because, you know, you, you took the small sample, but you're not sure how that applies to the big scale. Like if we take something that's a one by one structure and we now apply it to something that's, you know, a shed or a home that we want to build on Mars or, you know, the moon. Will it have the same properties? And if so, what kind of parameters do we need to change to actually make that structure viable? So, okay. So we, we know there's a ton of bubbles. Mm-hmm. We don't know how this actually affects the strength of the things that we want to build. So it, is she sending a ton of concrete into space <laughs> to do this? Or is she... I'm imagining there's also some magic around studying this small sample a lot to learn about patterns and do some modeling as well. Exactly. So we have some information about the small scale from the previous study. Now we need to start doing the analysis of it and see how it applies at the bigger scale, just like you said. So this is where the magic comes in, which is really just computation. Uh, NASA's multi-scale analysis tool, which is NASMAT, they're going to use that nice. tool to develop a model of the concrete samples and start doing all these simulations to figure out how's it going to behave and how do we optimize it. So it's like a, you know, a research that has two efforts going. And that's kind of what I love about it. Not only are we understanding it, we're also trying to reverse engineer it to see how we can um, make do with the ingredients that space, the space environment is giving us to make the best possible outcome. I think this is leading us down a really interesting rabbit hole. I wonder if at some point they will be able to model on Earth the same porosity structure that's in these concretes that set in space. Um, You know, similarly to how they tested the Mars rover in a Mars-like environment that had the right temperature, that had the right humidity, that had the right amount of dust, even though it was on Earth and not Mars, I'd like to see them simulate this and try to build some actual lunar structures, let's say, on earth and see how they fare. I agree, man. I think once they study this and they figure out how much more porous is it and how much weaker is it, they can do a lot of cool simulations on earth that won't require us to keep sending stuff into space to figure out how it works. Yeah. And one of the things I was thinking about is, so concrete, typically the way we've done it on earth is mix it and then pour it into a structure. Right. But what we've covered a couple of times, I think at this point, is concrete 3D printing. It's become super big. Yeah. You mix it, and then just like a uh, FDM print, 3D printer you can buy from Amazon, it pours it out in this specific structure. So there's some FDM printers where instead of it being out in the open, it's inside a chamber where you control like the temperature and everything else so that you get the print that you want for the material you're using. It kind of made me wonder, like if we plan on doing 3D printing of concrete, 
on a lunar surface? Could we also set up an enclosure that maybe doesn't give you gravity, but gives you some other conditions that m takes that porosity away? Yeah, well, there's almost all these companies that we talked about that do really interesting stuff in 3D printing for making structures and habitats. Um, we talked about some of the podcasts for concrete. We also talked about some other ones that we saw, like Branch Technologies. Love we Branch. saw them at a conference. Yep. Most of them, at least the biggest ones, are funded by grants from NASA mm -hmm. to try and print lunar structures. And they participate in these lunar 3D printing competitions. So uh, any of them that are using concrete, they've got to keep a close eye on this research um, and figure it out. Because, you know, as... I, as most people say, zero gravity, but what the nerds and engineers say, microgravity, um, could actually have a serious impact on how strong their structures are. Yeah, and it's, again, I mentioned it earlier, but I feel like everything space-related was so focused on transportation for a long time. And then now you had these companies that were in the background trying to like plan out what the future of it would look like. Well, the future's now. Like now we need to actually know how we're going to build these things and now they're coming to the yeah. forefront and we're learning more about them and i'm so much more excited than i used to be this yeah there's there's companies that like varda space i haven't heard of that them. talk about moving all of manufacturing into space so there's no emissions on earth like <sighs> if you had told me that five years ago i would say that's a far off reality today i'd say that's a kind of far off reality but i can see the light at the end of the tunnel now that we've got rockets going up and down into space like almost every single week now yeah and uh, Manufacturing in space makes so much more sense when you think about, you know, the limitations you have in terms of your payload. So, yeah, the future is bright. Well, We're in another space age, and I'm just happy to be a part of it. Yeah, it's really exciting to me. And I actually, I want to give a little tidbit. I'm not sure if this is just something that I learned researching for our space episode or if it's something that everyone knows, but I kind of hinted to it earlier, the difference between what's zero gravity and microgravity. Yeah, you're a total nerd. Technically... Right What's floating out in space, if it's in orbit of any planet, it's technically in microgravity. So you don't experience any gravity. You know, if you put a drop of water in the air, it'll just float there. It won't move anywhere. Mm -hmm. But technically, you're still experiencing gravity because the body you're sitting on, like the ISS, is in orbit around a planet. And when it's orbiting around Earth, the reason, you know, the thing that's causing it to orbit is gravity. So it's, they call it microgravity, not zero gravity, because you still have tiny gravitational forces acting on you. So if anyone was confused when we said microgravity, like I would be, if I didn't do research for this, that's why, and that's what it means, and that's where it comes from. Gotcha. Negligible gravity. Yeah. She works.